Part 1. The Journey. Chapter 1. God's Ways Don't Change. Come over to Macedonia and help us, begged the man in the Apostle Paul's vision. How can Macedonia not be significant today? It was the entry point, the doorway for the gospel that has upended the lives of all of us who live in Europe, the Americas, much of Africa and Australasia, plus millions elsewhere too. As soon as the Holy Spirit gave Paul that vision, he and his team set sail across the northern Aegean Sea and made for Philippi, the provincial capital. It was an adventure, certainly for Paul and his friends, a new continent, different cultures, new dangers, but they said yes to God's invitation. And event followed event with exhilarating speed. A local businesswoman and her family were converted. A slave girl was released from demon possession. There was violent opposition. And God intervened via an earthquake and a thriving church was established. God's way of calling people to adventures and miracles that will impact the world has never changed. Brother Jimmy, my main contact in North Macedonia, is one of these people. Jimmy, a Nigerian, was the third of seven children brought up as Christians to read the Bible and pray every day. At boarding school, he started questioning the existence of God. Then one night he awoke and had a heavenly vision from God, which he could make no sense of. Shortly afterwards, he was taken seriously ill. The local doctors could not diagnose it and just told him that he would die quickly. In his own words, my mother was intense in prayers for me. The Lord gave her a vision which she interpreted to mean that the Lord was going to show mercy to me and I would not die but live and then declare his goodness on earth. I did recover but I deliberately started to forget the Lord and tried to run away from him. I fled to Macedonia and started a restaurant business that went downhill very quickly. As a broken man, I decided to rededicate my life to God again. When I was back visiting Nigeria, I joined a tiny church that fasted and prayed almost like fanatics. It was here for the first time I learned to fast and one night at about 4.30 a.m. I heard a loud voice calling, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. It was so loud, but did not burst my eardrums. Three questions were asked. Do you want to prosper in life? Do you want to advance in life? Do you want to move forward in life? And this sound was so sweet to my ears and startled by the questions. I answered, yes, yes, yes. And the voice came again. Do my work, do my work do my work. I was called back to Macedonia to take the gospel where there was none, to walk with people that nobody wants to walk with, and to be a mouthpiece for those who cannot speak for themselves, and to fight for the marginalised. Jimmy returned and started planting churches, mostly in the poorer towns and villages across the country. There are now around 30 he leads a small team of pastors that travel hundreds of miles on potholed roads, visiting groups often squeezed into rooms or small halls, teaching ministry and leading worship, sometimes at three or four different churches in a single day. To travel with them can be simultaneously exhausting and exhilarating. Back in Paul's time, sharing the gospel would often lead to riots or miracles. Even today, there is that sense of being on the front line with God, not knowing what will happen next. Since Paul's days, the region has been scarred by violence and war, by the long occupation of the Islamic Ottoman Empire, by communism, corruption, poverty and injustice. The Jesus-centred, Holy Spirit-led church that Paul started has been lost, replaced now by a combination of orthodoxy and Islam. The lost church certainly makes it exciting to work for Jesus in Macedonia today. 
as you step out with the gospel on your lips, offering to pray for people in the power of the Holy Spirit, you know you're breaking new ground. Many of the older villagers were born in the communist era when atheism was taught in schools. When you are set up to do evangelism in a village and a local Christian leader tells you to his knowledge that there has not been outreach there before, you get a sense of that same pioneering experience that Paul had. You're walking on the same land that he walked. In many places you go, you are the missionary, the first to preach the good news of Jesus to them in their lifetime. I am confident of this, said Paul to those first Christians in Macedonia, that God who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's a pretty clear promise that God is still passionate about the Macedonian church today. I first met Brother Jimmy in 2016 when he'd come to the UK for a few days, including a visit to the New Wine Christian Festival at Shepton Mallet in Somerset. This big Christian festival left an impression on him. All his small churches were scattered across the country and did not have the opportunity to meet together. Jimmy invited three of us who were in a prayer group to visit North Macedonia. His vision was to put on a conference and we would be the speakers. It seemed an impossible request, but we did not dismiss the idea. A few weeks later, as I prayed over a map of Macedonia, my attention was drawn to a town on the eastern border called Delchevo. A phrase suddenly came into my head, weeping stays for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Then I got a sense of sadness and pain pervading the people there. We prayed into whatever pain the town was experienced and asked for the joy of the Lord to visit them. A few days later, I woke up in the middle of the night with that phrase ringing over and over in my head. I discovered it was from the Psalms. I also got a sense that one day I'd be sharing that message in that very town. It seemed most unlikely and that a distant possibility at best. I had never spoken abroad and I had no concept of how I might end up in Delchevo. Incredibly, within only four weeks, I crossed the border from Bulgaria into North Macedonia for the first time on a spontaneous short break holiday with my youngest son. Everything seemed alien. I had just endured an hour of questions and demands for endless paperwork by the border guards who spoke Bulgarian. The small border town I crossed into en route to our holiday destination was none other than Delchevo. The streets were bustling. We might have been in Greece or Turkey, but this had the feel of a place more starved of investment. It was Sunday and the small church was scheduled to start at 1pm, just a few minutes after we arrived. Feeling relieved to have made it, we drew some wicker chairs up around a circular metal table outside a spacious glass-fronted cafe. Almost opposite the cafe was a small rented room, slotted into a row of rental buildings. The Delchevo church was no bigger than a decent-sized sitting room. It was sparse. Some steel chairs were tightly packed around the walls, and on the sea-blue carpet stood one small table. In opposite corners were coffee-making facilities and a toilet. That was it. A few minutes later, three of Brother Jimmy's helpers, who cover the Eastern churches on Sunday, arrived. They opened up with prayer and worship. They shared that on the way they had been praying that every chair in the small church room would be full. In other words, they'd prayed for doubling of the congregation's normal size. As they looked around, every seat was taken. Then three more people arrived. Immediately, I was thrown in right at the deep end. I was handed the floor and told I should lead the church for the next 45 minutes. In a country and culture I had never experienced. Through Magdalena, my young interpreter, I started by sharing the words that I had received for Delchevo a month earlier. Though there is pain in the night, joy comes in the morning. The pain included the loss of many of their young and educated people to other countries. We prayed the joy of the Lord into their lives, their church and their town. The talk and translation followed on 
and lasted exactly the allotted time without me padding or cutting short the talk. Everyone seemed very encouraged. and I was left astounded by God's provision and timing, astounded to be used in this way for the first time in a foreign country. I would not have thought it possible. It was right after the service that I realised the courage and sacrifice that God had called these people to. Jesus' challenge is the same today as it has always been, but so is his power. We went back with the church leader and his family who cooked up some traditional Macedonian food for us, which was most welcome as we had not eaten for seven hours. During this time, we learnt more of the pain that hovered like a cloud over Delchevo. Our host family had certainly not been exempt. Since joining the evangelical church plant, they had faced persecution for leaving the Orthodox Church. The leader's wife had been forced out of her well-paid job, and he himself had been demoted to a more menial job, well below the level of his qualifications or experience. But they assured us that having Jesus in their lives more than made up for any loss. What the Apostle Paul had found in that first Macedonian church was just as true today because the Holy Spirit is just as real, just as powerful and just as present today. The number of evangelical Christians in North Macedonia is very small, a few thousand people only, somewhere between 0.2 and 1% of the 2 million population. This includes the Baptists, Methodists and other Bible studying, Jesus loving Christians such as Brother Jimmy's network of churches. However, this number fluctuates a lot. Its biggest challenge is not persecution, but migration. One of the poorest countries in Europe, North Macedonia has an average income of about 350 euros a month. It has a GDP less than that of the small island of Malta. 60% live below the poverty line, some unable to get enough fuel to see them through the bitter winters. There are few good jobs, so many educated people look to migrate for work and families follow. A big church in North Macedonia would be 30 people or more. Some could double that for a short period, but then two years later could be down to just a handful. The believers have not lost faith, but en masse have escaped their poverty for Germany, USA, Canada or anywhere else with better paid work. This certainly focuses the mind of the faithful church. Intense outreach and evangelism is needed just to keep the churches going. It wasn't too challenging to visit North Macedonia on a short holiday and visit a church. But what about Brother Jimmy's invitation for three of us to help organise a national Christian conference of worship, teaching and healing? More than that, He was asking us to be the main speakers. In a country that felt so different to ours, where the needs were beyond anything I'd imagined, where opposition, sometimes violent, was normal, where poverty could be extreme, where witchcraft and demonic activity were just below the surface. Here, fine words would never be enough. If we couldn't rely on the Holy Spirit's miraculous work, we would be mad to take up the challenge. Yet God had prepared us. Each of us who went out to North Macedonia for the first Easter conference has a different backstory, a tale of God at work. Before we go any further, I'd better tell you mine. Chapter one, learning keys. God calls us to go on an adventure of faith. You may get thoughts of God calling you to something which seems impossible, but don't dismiss them too quickly. Be open to him finding a way for it to happen. Sometimes there is a cost to making the decision to follow God's voice, but it is the right thing to do, whatever the price.